keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure love Just the sum of every high and every low Remind me once again just who I am Because I need to know can uh, read my notes here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Life Point Community Church. Uh, those that are watching online, um, special welcome to you as well. Let me just fix this mic. Is that better? I hope so. Okay. We are, uh, we had started a transformation series a few weeks back and Rick Warren uh, last time spoke about spiritual health and gave us some great steps and habits for our spiritual growth. 
And I want to circle back to that at some time, at some point in the future. Um, but today's topic is going to be focused on our physical health and going from stressed to blessed. Um, and to help us with that today, we are going to look at one of the most famous Psalms in the Bible, Psalm 23. Yes, someone read their life news this morning. So we spend a lot of money on relieving stress in our lives, right? Stress at its core is simply a threat, whether that's real or perceived. And whenever our body feels threatened by something emotional, physical, spiritual, mentally, that, str that threats, threat stress response takes place in our body. What happens? Your blood pressure goes up, right? Your pulse quickens, the adrenaline shoots uh, you know, into your body, and all kinds of other kind of physical effects. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's pretty good, right? If you're standing in the road and a truck is coming towards you, your, your response says, get out of the way, right? Get off the road. And that gives you that extra burst of energy to do that. That's a good thing. The problem is in chronic stress. And we go, and we're going to deal with that today because hundreds and hundreds of scientific and medical studies have shown that chronic stress in your life is dangerous and devastating to your physical health. It's damaging to your brain to always be in chronic stress and it's deadly to your body. Stress, chronic stress can kill you. What I wanna to do today is specifically look at all the effects of stress on our body and what the Bible says is the antidote to the most common stresses in your life. So if you're feeling a little tired or if you're a little bit stressed out, you've picked a great week to come to church because we're going to help you out as we look at the most famous psalm in the Bible, Psalm... You got it. So before we look at the text, let's identify seven most common sources of stress in today's life. The, there are... Uh, these are the seven things that cause stress most often in today's lifestyle. Number one, worry. The reason why worry is number one is because there's a lot more things to worry about than there was a lot of, uh, 100 years ago, right? Nobody was worried about identity theft 20 or 30 years ago, right? No one was worried that they were going to lose their cell phone 20, 30 years ago. There's a lot of things we worry about today that our parents didn't have to worry about. And that's because there are new worries in an increasingly complex world. The second greatest source of, stre of stress is hurry. <sighs> hurry comes from the increasing pace in your life. Would you agree that it seems that life is just going faster and faster? We live in a microwave and nanosecond world where everyone wants it now. They want it yesterday, right? They want it immediately. And everything is going faster and faster. That creates stress, speed, that creates stress, right? Speed creates stress. The third thing causes, that causes stress is crowds. As the world gets more and more crowded, people are getting more stressed out. The reason why is, is that we have this thing called urbanization, right? People are moving to the cities. They're actually now, because of COVID, they're moving out of the cities. So that's a good thing. But uh, people are moving to the cities. So life, it used to be rural, right? And now it's definitely urban. John and Carol, you would definitely see that even in Kleinberg, where you used to live, right? There was land all around you. Now there's townhouses. Um, and houses going up there. So, and what happens when there's more and more people, it causes more traffic. So we have traffic stress. And I read one study that said that in the uh, 75 largest cities in America, that Americans wasted over four billion um, hours waiting in traffic jams. So just, amount, just imagine the amount of productivity that was lost in just that right? And just imagine all the gasoline that was wasted. 
So while you're stuck in traffic, that is stress. The fourth modern stress in, in, um, in today's world is multiple choice or more choices than we had before. Actually, the more choices you have in life, you would think that that was more freeing, right? That that would be more liberating. But actually, it is more paralyzing because it creates indecision. We used to be able to walk into the grocery store and there used to be a couple of, of brands of toothpaste, right? Now there's over 60 brands of toothpaste. Same with cough syrup, everything, right? There used to be only a few little brands. Now there's so many choices. How do we know which one to get, right? The more choices you have, it can be paralyzing. When you think about all the coffee at Starbucks or the different choices at Starbucks, right? It can be a little bit overwhelming. The, the, uh, fifth, um, the fifth area is the loss of privacy. So any loss is stressful. But in the modern world, the loss of privacy is not just the government watching over you, but all kinds of corporations keeping their number on you. They want to know where you are and who you are and what you said and what you bought, right? Every time you go to buy something, someone rings it up and they're keeping a record of how many pampers you bought and then when you will need to go to depends. The loss of privacy causes stress. The sixth one is pluralism. And what is pluralism? We now live in a world where people around you often have different beliefs, different convictions, different lifestyles, different cultures and things like that. A hundred years ago, there was a common, commonly held values people shared in common. That's just not true anymore. Technology has shrunk the globe and we are now in a melting pot. We are more like a stew, I think, right? People who live all around you, work all around you, often have very different beliefs than you. Many people have um, different cultural values and things like that. But what does this mean? It means there's going to be conflict. And conflict comes from being around different people. And of course, the media feeds on conflict. And it's created this culture where people are just rude to each other. Number seven, the final one, is the fear of the future. This is the what ifs, right? The fear of the future. So let's read Psalm 23. because um, all of the, these antidotes are in this psalm. It's only six verses long, but we find seven antidotes in these six verses. Let me read that. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all I need. He makes me lay down in lush green meadows, and he leads me beside calm, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy, so that's goodness and love, will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the most beloved psalm in the Bible. And it's not by accident because it has given comfort to so many people for so many years. But when you really dig into it, though, when you really understand each of these metaphors, it is telling you how to lower your stress. It's a model of stress management. How many of you would like to be healthier? Proverbs uh, 14.30 says, Peace of mind makes the body healthy. Peace of mind makes the body healthy. It's not always what you eat, but what eats you that makes you unhealthy. So we've got to figure out how to lower the stress and raise the peace of mind. How many of you would like to live longer? Yeah. <laughs> Look at the next verse. It says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. It's about attitude. Wow. So I want us today, in Psalm 23, take this passage and tear it apart 
line by line. I want us to see that there are seven spiritual habits for reducing stress. stress. And they actually parallel with the seven sources of stress that we just gave you in the modern world. And I said that the first cause of stress in your life is worry. And you worry because you think, will I have what I need when I need it? And any time you expect other people to meet your needs instead of God, you are going to be frustrated. You're going to be disappointed. And they're not going to be able to measure up because nobody can meet all your needs. No man, no woman, no one. Only God can meet all your needs. So the first antidote, and this is important, and you have notes, so if you want to write them down, you can. If you don't want to, that's fine. But the first antidote is to look to God to meet all my needs. That's the first thing that David says we need to do. I look to God to meet all my needs, and that calms me down. That way, I'm not going to be disappointed because I'm going to trust in God. So this single change in your life, you stop looking to other people to meet your needs. If you'd stop looking to your spouse or your partner to meet your needs, your stress would go down dramatically. Stop putting your security in things that you can lose. Sometimes people put their security in their job and they lose their job and so they lose their peace of mind. And sometimes people put their security in their marriage and their spouse dies or they go through a divorce and they say, who am I? What is my identity? Or you might put your security in your money and there are a lot of ways you can lose your money. So as your pastor and your friend, I recommend that you never ever put your security in anything that can be taken away from you. Let me say that again. You should always put your security, find your security in something that can never be taken from you. You can lose your job. You can lose your health. You can lose your reputation. You can lose your spouse. You can lose your mind. But you cannot lose your relationship with Jesus. So you put your security in that. You look to God to meet all your needs. Psalm 21 23 verse 1 says the Lord is my shepherd so I have all I need I shall not want I have nothing that I don't need because he's going to be my shepherd I stop expecting other people to meet the needs that only God can meet so stop looking to other people to meet your needs because they're going to let you down there's no one who could possibly meet all your emotional needs. There is no one who could possibly meet all your physical, mental, spiritual needs. So David says, I am not going to look to other people to meet all my needs. I'm going to look to God. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have all that I need. What's he saying here? That is the first step to stress reduction, to focus on God. I stop focusing on expecting other people to meet my needs and I refocus on God. Isaiah 30, 15 says, the sovereign Lord says, only in returning to me and waiting for me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. Notice he doesn't say in anxiety and fear or not in hard work and planning, not in self-motivation and positive mental attitude. He says in quietness and confidence is your strength. The Lord is my shepherd. In fact, I want you to make this an affirmation in your life. Every time you start to get stressed out, you need to pause and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. So when you get stressed out like this, and you don't have everything that you need right now, the Lord is my shepherd. He is going to provide. He is going to take care of me. I am going to look to God for all my needs. Once you've laid that down, that's the bedrock of stress management. Then you go on to the second step, which is number two. I need to obey God's instruction about rest. Huh. So much of the stress in your life comes from always being in a hurry, always working too much, always feeling like you've got too much to do. That's why you overwork, right? You never, ever get caught up. 
How many of you feel like that you can never get caught up? True confession time. Ozzy, how many emails do I have in my inbox right now? There's no way I'm ever going to get caught up. There's just too many. So what do you do? You look to God to meet your needs, and then you obey God's instructions about rest. There's no way I can say, I'm just going to stay up for the next three months and go through all my emails. No, you've still got to rest. Think about this. If God wanted to, he could have created human beings without the need for sleep. So why did he create with you with the need for sleep? You know, you will spend a third of your life asleep. If God's only going to give you 60, 80, 100 years, why on earth wouldn't he give you 100% of the time? Why would one third of that time be wasted for sleep? Because God wants you to learn the importance of rest. Rest is so important that God modeled it. When he created the whole universe, the Bible says that after he finished all the creation, he said on the seventh day, God rested. Why did he rest? He wasn't tired. God doesn't need to rest. He never gets tired. But he was modeling the importance of rest to your life. He says every seventh day, you rest. And the Bible is filled with instructions about rest, recreation, relaxation, right? In fact, it is so important that God put it in the big 10, right? The 10 commandments, it's right up there with do not commit adultery, do not murder. He says, every seventh day, you take a day off. Hello, that's how important a Sabbath life is. Jesus later said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God created, God said, I created this idea of you to take a day off every seven days for rest, recreation, worship, rest and restoration. That's his idea. And it's for your own benefit. So you don't burn out. Yet today, in our modern society, people aren't doing that. Even on their day off, they're working. And a lot of people, even if they go to church, what will they do? They'll go right back to back home and start working, trying to get all the stuff done that they didn't get done during the week. That's not a Sabbath. God says, I want you to rest. Psalm 23 verse 2 says this, he makes me lie down. Does God ever make you lay down? Because you weren't smart enough to obey what he says about rest and take a day off every week? Sometimes if you're not smart enough to get the rest you need and take a day off every week, your body will make sure you do it. God has wired your body in such a way, if you don't take time off, your body will make time off. God wired you to obey his commandments. So getting enough sleep is essential for stress management. And you're not wasting time when you're relaxing and you're not wasting time when you're resting. That's why God gave us a Sabbath. Here's the Sabbath in Exodus. Six days are set aside for work, but every seventh day you must rest completely. Even during your seasons of plowing and harvest, you must observe the Sabbath day of rest. So even in your busiest season, it's not an excuse. You may be a tax tax accountant, and it might be April. You still have to take a day off. You may work in retail and it's Christmas. You still need to take a day off. You may be a farmer and it may be harvest or planting season. You still have to take a day off. You may be a nurse and it's COVID. You still have to take a day off. What am I supposed to do on this Sabbath? There are three things that we suggest that you do on your Sabbath. Number one, rest your body physically rest. It's the biblical basis for a good Sunday afternoon nap. (laughs) Just don't do it while I'm preaching. Number two, refocus your spirit. I rest my body on the Sabbath and I refocus my spirit. What's that? That's worship. That's what we're doing today, right? We're refocusing our spirit right now by coming to worship. Number three, recharge your emotions. So use the Sabbath to recharge your emotions. 
That's what recreation does, right? It recharges your emotions. And people do different things, right? They recharge different ways. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, about how we need beauty in our life. You need to do something that restores you and re-energizes you. It could be a hobby, it could be a sport. These are good things that God's given you in order to recharge your emotions. Now, it doesn't really matter what day your Sabbath is. Colossians in the Bible says it doesn't matter which day you choose, you just need to choose a day. So my Sabbath is not Sunday. Sunday is my work day for me. By the way, so is Saturday. And so Monday is my Sabbath. On Monday, I will rest and refocus and recharge. I don't do any work on Mondays, at least I'm trying not to. That's my Sabbath. And by the way, don't call it your day off. Because it's, if it's your day off, you're going to cheat on it, right? What are you going to do? You're going to sneak things in there and try to do things. But if you call it your Sabbath, you use it for what God intended it to be. By the way, did you know that during the French Revol Revolution, the French government canceled Sabbath and said every day is going to be a work day? Then a couple of years later, they had to reinstate it because of the health of the nation had crumbled. You need this in your life. You need a Sabbath. I look to God to meet all my needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I obey God's instructions about rest. He makes me lie down. Number three, recharge my soul with beauty. So that's the third thing we need to do. Recharge your soul with beauty. Beauty is an incredible important thing in stress management. Ugliness stresses you out. Beauty inspires. Beauty encourages. Beauty motivates. Beauty stirs up positive emotions. Have you ever thought about why God made the world so beautiful? You look at the sunsets and the sunrises, the beautiful flowers, all these things around the world that God has created. Man was made to live in the garden, right? Not a skyscraper. When God created man, he put him in the Garden of Eden. He didn't put him in a skyscraper. He wasn't made to live in everything concrete. God made us to live in a garden in a beautiful place. And we've come a long way since the Garden of Eden on this planet. But you feel so close to God in nature. Of course you do. It's God's beauty, and beauty inspires, and beauty motivates Notice the next verse, Psalm 22, 23, 2 to 3. He makes me lie down. Where does he make me lie down? He makes me lie down in lush green meadows and leads me beside calm, quiet waters. He restores my soul. It's no wonder this psalm is the most beloved psalm because we can all visualize this, can't we? When I say to you, think about lush green meadows and quiet, calm lake, you just relax thinking about it, right? If I say, think about downtown Toronto, you get stressed out. But if I say, think about meadows and calm waters and babbling brooks, nature refreshes because beauty inspires. You need to see beautiful scenes and you need to hear beautiful sounds in order to keep stress down in your life. You need to add beauty to your life. Let me give you a few suggestions. Number one, get outside every day. If you're not getting outside every day, your stress is going up. Even if it's in your backyard or for a walk around the block or take your lunch outside and, and just look at a tree and uh, just look and, and enjoy the beauty. You need to get in touch with God's creation. You need to surround yourself with beauty. So get outside. The second thing is to start your day with God, not the media. Before you go and read any text, before you go and check your email, before you turn the radio on, before you turn the television on, you need to get in touch with God first. <coughs> that will dramatically reduce your stress and in increase your mood. Number three, intentionality put beauty around you. So pieces of art or, or music that inspires you or craft, something to remind you of beauty. So art, if you can get into it, can be beautiful. There are two things that I did in the past six months. 
because this is an area that I need to improve in. But um, in the summer, I went to the Van, Van Gogh, Van Gogh art show. How do you pronounce it? Van Gogh. Van Gogh. Sorry, art show. That's how arty I am. But it was beautiful, and I made myself just stand there and, and look at the beautiful paintings and the colours and just to enjoy it. And I, and I ended up falling in love with it. And the second thing I did is I went down to Toronto um, and, and heard the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, and they were playing Mozart and Beethoven, all the classical music, and I just allowed that to enter my body. It was a great experience of both art and music. So God gives us music. <coughs> Sorry. God gave us music and he gave us art for one reason, to express emotion. That's it. That's the whole purpose of it. You don't need it for physical survival, but you do need it to really live, to be who God made you to be. So fill your life with art and fill your life with music. Philippians 4.8 says this, you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true and noble, reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly. There's a lot of ugliness in this world. There are a lot of unpleasant things in this world. So whatever you give your attention to is going to either raise or lower your stress. So I recharge my soul with beauty. He makes me lie down in green meadows beside calm waters. The fourth thing is to go to God for guidance. Now this is important because a common source of stress in your life is indecision. You can't make up your mind. Some of you right now are wavering. You're at the fork in the road and maybe you've got some, some multiple options and you just can't decide and that stress is killing you. You can't decide whether to get in or go out or, or neither, right? You've got too many choices perhaps. So I recommend that you make God the number one source for guidance not the opinions of friends, not some authority on television, but you go to God for guidance because he always tells the truth. What do I do? I say, God, I need wisdom. James 1 says this, if any man lacks wisdom, let him go to God and ask him, and he gives to all men liberally and doesn't condemn them or criticize them. He gives it generously and graciously. God is waiting to give you wisdom. You just need to ask. So you say, God, I need wisdom. I pray and I ask and then I wait and I think and I be quiet and I listen and I sense at the right time, maybe not immediately, but at the right time, God will put that idea in my mind and you go, wow, that's inspiration. I need to do that. This is an affirmation, right? God will guide me at the right time, not in the the wrong time. His timing is perfect. He's never early and he's never late. If you have to make a decision about next year, he is not going to give you the answer today. Why? Because he wants you to trust him. The Bible says there's enough trouble in each day. Take one day at a time. So God is going to give you the right decision and the right guidance if you trust him. Psalm 23.3 says, he guides me in the right paths for his name's sake. This is an affirmation. God, I believe you're going to guide me at the right time in the right way. I believe that you're going to do that. And if you have that belief, he's going to do it. Number five, trust God in, in the dark valleys. So trust God is in the dark valleys. So we're all going through... We're all going to go through dark valleys in our lives, right? You'll go through many of them in your lifetime. One of the most common sources of stress is loss. You can lose your job. You can lose your income. You can lose your money. You can lose your health. You can lose your reputation. You can lose your loved one. We all go through many losses in life. And when you go through loss, there are always two common reactions. One is fear and the other is grief. Grief is good, fear is bad. Grief is the way we get through the transitions of life. 
Grief is a good thing. The Bible says God grieves. It's a godly emotion. In fact, if you don't grieve, you can get stuck. Some of you have had major losses in your life in the past and you've just shoved it down. You've stuffed it instead of grieving. And when you stuff it, you can get stuck at that stage emotionally. You've never gone back any further because you didn't go through grief. You've got to, you've got to, and you get stuck, right? So sometimes we need to go back into things in our life and grieve over it so we can get unstuck. Stop pushing the pain down. Just grieve it. Let it out. Grief will not kill you. If you let it out, it's good for you. It's how you go through the transitions of life. Then you get unstuck, and then you can move forward, and you can grow up emotionally. Grief is a good thing. On the other hand, fear is a bad thing. Not once in the Bible does it say, grieve not, sorrow not, weep not, cry not. But what it does say is fear not. And it says that 365 times, which means there is one for every day of the year. Because grief doesn't paralyze. Fear does. Psalm 23, 4. Here's what David says. Even though I walk, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I don't fear anything. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. So remember here, David is using shepherd metaphor, right? Shepherd and sheep. Shepherds always carry a rod and staff, right? They are, use these tools to protect the sheep. He says, I'm not going to stress out about this because God is my protector. God is helping me. I am going to trust God in the dark valleys, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Some of you today are going through the shadow, going through the valley of the shadow right now. Maybe the valley of the shadow of death. It may be the valley of the shadow of debt. It may be the valley of the shadow of conflict. It may be the valley of the shadow of depression. It may be the valley of the shadow of discouragement, but you are going through the valley of the shadow. Shadows are scary. Do you remember when you were a kid, you used to get scared when you were laying in bed? As a little kid, I remember that. Some of the things that I've learned about shadows is this. Shadows can't hurt you. Some of the things, uh, sorry, they, they can't hurt you. A truck can run over you, but the, the truck's shadow can't run over you. It doesn't hurt you. A shadow can't hurt you. And shadows are always bigger than the source. Isn't that true? It's your fear of that greater than the actual event. Shadows are always bigger than the source and makes them look bigger than they actually are. But here's the good news. Wherever there's a shadow, there's light. You can't have a shadow without a light. So the key when you're going through the valley of the shadow is to not to, not to be afraid, is to turn your back on the shadow and look to the light. Because as long as I keep my eyes on the light, the shadow can't scare me. And Jesus is the light of the world. That's how you go through the valley of the shadow of death. That's how you lower your stress. I trust God in the dark valleys. And maybe you're going through that right now. And you need to pray like David in Psalm 142.3. When I am ready to give up, he knows what I need to do. When I'm ready to give up, he knows what I should do. I want you to write that down. I don't have to know the answers when I know God. I don't have to know all the answers about what I'm going through if I know God because he knows what I should do. And if I'm going to turn my back on the shadow and I'm going to look at the light and I'm going to walk through that valley of the shadow, I am going to trust God in the dark valleys. That will reduce your stress of loss. The next verse, Psalm 23, David says, I'm going to let God be my defender. So let God be my defender. Another common source of stress is conflict, right? O opposition, criticism, attacks. There are people in your life who simply don't like you. There are people you work with 
they criticize you, maybe out of jealousy, maybe out of fear, maybe there are people in your own family who will not let you enjoy anything. They're always putting you down. They never, let, never have a positive word. And if you have any success, they play it down. They minimize it. You've had these people in your life and they're always attacking you and they're always putting you down. They're always criticizing you. When that happens, your natural response is what? Attack back, criticize back, right? You want to retaliate, you want to get even. But when you do that with somebody who's criticizing you, <laughs> it puts you at the same level, doesn't it? But when you forgive them, it puts you above them. But if you get even, you're no better than they are. And because of the pluraliz pluralization in our society, we have people around us all the time who totally disagree with us, who don't agree with you and they don't like you. And as a result, they criticize you and they will put you down. There are other reasons, of course, not just because of that. But in our society today, our civilization is losing, is losing its civil civility. The world is getting so rude, right? They're getting so mean. Would you agree with that? Yeah. One of the things that's causing this is the internet. Because of the internet, it allows you to hide behind the scene of the spouts of kinds of vile things against other people, things that people would never say to you face to face. They wouldn't have the courage to say, right? And they minimize you, or they belittle you, or they're rude to you, or they criticize you, and they will attack you on the internet. And all they're doing is revealing the smallness of their heart. Little people belittle people. Great people make people feel great. So when somebody always belittling other people, they're just revealing the smallness of their heart. How do you handle rude people? How do you handle mean people? You don't. You let God handle them. You let God be your defender. David is a pro at this because David knows what it means to be attacked, not just emotionally or verbally, but literally physically. In the story of King David, David, uh, as a young man, was anointed by Samuel, God's prophet, to be the next king of Israel. But it was done in secret, so nobody knew about it. David knew about it. His family knew about it. He knew he was the rightful king. Then for the next years, the better part of, of much of his life, he spends it running from the first king who wants to kill him. He's hiding in caves and he's being demeaned and he's being put down. Yet... He never said a bad thing against the king. He would never attack back. He would never retaliate. He only said good. God was preparing David to be the king after his, his own heart. And David says in Psalm 23, 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What's David talking about here? It's a metaphor. He's saying, you know what? God is so good to me. He says, I'm going to give you, David, a banquet in front of your enemies. I am going to anoint your head with oil, which is just saying to the world, hey, this is my guy. Back off. This is the guy I've chosen. This is the guy who's going to be the next leader. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. God, you are so good to me in spite of my attackers, in spite of my critics. You just keep blessing me and blessing me. I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to let you be my defender. Psalm 18, David says this. How I love you, Lord. You are my defender, my protector, and my fortress. In you I am safe. You protect me like a shield. Does David sound stressed to you? No. And he's writing this from a cave while he's hiding. I'm not worried. God is in control. God is my defender. I don't have to defend myself. God will take care of me. It takes a lot of faith to rest when you're under attack. It takes a lot of faith to trust God when you just don't defend yourself when you're being slandered and when you're being misunderstood and when you're being misjudged in your office or by other workers 
rumours are spreading about you. People are saying things about you online. When that happens, everything in you wants to rise up. I've got to do something about this. I've got to correct this. I've got to teach the truth. When you're under attack, it takes faith to trust God. It also takes humility. It takes humility not to retaliate, but to let God be your defender. But you are most like Jesus when you remain silent under attack. Jesus was constantly attacked. And who was he attacked by? The religious people. The religious people did not like Jesus. The common, the ordinary, the everyday people, they loved Jesus. The prostitutes, the pimps, the tax collectors, the crooks, the thieves, the outcast people, the lepers, they all loved Jesus. It was the religious people who could not stand him. They called him a glutton. They called him a drunk. They called him a son, the son of the devil. They called him the devil himself. They said they, he came from the devil. They said that he was a false leader, a false prophet, and so on. And Jesus never retaliated. He never got back at them. He never co corrected them. He just remained silent. Even the night before he goes to the cross, the Pharisees take Jesus into custody and made him a prisoner. And they take him to the Roman governor, Pilate, and they said to Pilate, this guy is trying to overthrow Rome. And that was a bogus lie. He was attacked. They said, this guy is trying to overthrow Rome and wants your job. He's trying to get rid of you. And Pilate looks at Jesus and he says, is this true? Is this true what they say? Is what they're saying is right? <laughs> and it says that Jesus spoke not a word unto them. He couldn't even dignify the accusation with a response. He remained silent because he had entrusted himself into the care of his father. You are most like Christ when you remain silent in criticism. There is just one more common source of stress, and that is fearing the future. The seventh thing David says in this beautiful psalm is, expect God to finish what he starts in me. Are you a person who is afraid of the future? Are you a what ifer? Are you always what ifing? What if this happens? What if this went wrong? What if this went bad? What if, what if, what if? If you are a what ifer, it leads to enormous amount of stress in your life unnecessary stress because here's what David says in Psalm 23 6 surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life that's what we've got to look forward to goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever when a shepherd has a flock of sheep he usually has a couple of sheep dogs then and the shepherd would be leading from the front and the sheep dogs would be at the back kind of trying to keep all the sheep in line. And these two sheepdogs is mercy and love, or goodness and love. And they're following you all along through your life. Is that what, to, what you expect? You tend to look at your future one in two ways. You can say, what if everything goes wrong? What if I don't have enough money? What if I lose my job? What if somebody walks out on me? What if, what if, what if? You can do that, or you can look at your future and say, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those are your options. You can either see from God's viewpoint, or you can see it from a place of fear. How do you lower the stress? You say, I'm going to expect God to finish what he starts. What do you expect? There's a word for that. It's called a goal. If you don't set goals, you're not living by faith. Goals are statements of faith. Set a goal for your physical health and your spiritual health. You might be saying, well, I'm tired of the pace that I've been living. I can't maintain it. It's not sustainable. It's not satisfying. It's not even fun. We're going to deal with those in the coming weeks. I don't know what burdens you're carrying. I don't know what's weighing you down, but I do know the answer. Jesus says, come to me, 
all you that are weary and are, ca and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For many years, I didn't understand that verse. In the first place, as a kid, I didn't know what a yolk was. I thought it was part of an egg. But a yolk is a board with two arches in it that you put over two cattle so that the two cattle will pull a cart. I'm sure John and Carol, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the value of the, of the yolk is that it halves the load. Right? Without a yoke, you've only got one cow that has to do the whole thing by itself. But if you yoke up the cow with another cow, then the two cows together pull the load together and the load is half as heavy. Does that make sense? So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, he's not saying I'm going to give you more problems. He's saying, take my yoke upon you. I'm going to share your problems. I'm going to share your load. I'm going to take your stress and I'm going to pull it with you. Wow. He says three verbs in this verse. He says come, he says um, learn, and he says take. Come to me. <coughs> and then he says take the yoke on you team up with me, partner with me, then learn how, to, how I do it. This is going to lighten your load. This is going to reduce your stress. This is going to make it easier for you to navigate. When I am yoked with Christ, we move together because you're yoked together. We move together in the same direction and at the same speed. Some of us want to go into another direction at a different speed. But when you yoke up with Jesus, you will go in the right direction and you will go at the speed that you can handle. And when you yoke to Jesus, you're not going to go off on a ditch because he's going to keep you on the right path. And when you're yoked to Jesus, you're not going to run too fast and burn yourself out because you're yoked to Jesus. You need to come to him now. Lord, I know there are many people who are tired and worn by the pace of modern living. And I know, Father, that these different stresses that we've looked at, so many of them can be seen right here in our midst today. We know that many people are stressed out, stressed out by worry, by fear, by conflict, by criticism, by indecision, by the rudeness of people around them, by a crowded schedule, by overwork, all of these different things. Lord, if we just do it your way, life would be so much easier. If we could keep the Sabbath to rest our bodies, refocus our spirit, recharge our emotions, if we would fill our souls with beauty, not ugliness, if we would hear sounds of beauty and see scenes of beauty rather than filling our minds with so much negative news and so much negative talk, all of that conflict that is in the media today. Lord, I pray that each of these steps that David took, that we would take today. Today, Now I want you to pray. Say, dear God, I want you to look to you. I want to look to you to meet all my needs. I know that there is no person that could possibly meet all my emotional, spiritual, mental, physical needs. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God, starting today, I'm going to obey your instructions about rest. You make me lie down in green pastures. Help me to fill my soul and my surroundings with beauty, with art, with music that you have given for the expression of emotions. Thank you that you make me lie down in green meadows and beside calm, quiet waters. Father, those things that I don't know what to do and I'm confused about and I lack wisdom, help me to go to you for guidance. Father, I need your wisdom in the days ahead. When I go through dark valleys, help me not to be afraid of that shadow. 
but to turn to the light and look into your eyes. And when I'm ready to give up, you know what I should do. Father, when I feel like I'm under attack and when I feel like others are against me, you will you be my defender. Help me to speak no words of unkindness, but to return good for evil, to pray for those who persecute, to love those who hate, to do good to those who do evil. Will you be my defender, my protector, my fortress? Will you protect me like a shield? Let me trust in you. And God, I'm going to expect you to finish what you start in me rather than what if in the future. I'm going to say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus, you said to come to you, so I come to you. I want to take your yoke on me. I want to team up with you. I want to learn from you. And I want to move forward in the direction and the pace that you choose. Slow me down, Lord, that I may see your plan for my life. And Jesus, I invite you to take over every area of my life and my mind. Replace my stress with your serenity. In your name we pray. Amen. See you next week, guys. Take care.